This is a production of Cornell University. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Cornell Turf webinar series. Uh, this is week six of our sports turf webinar. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues here trying to record the first half of this uh, webinar, but we did. Uh, we were able to capture the second half. Uh, so our, our, week, our guest this week is Dr. Chase Straw of Texas A&M University. And so we're going to pick up the conversation uh, where him and Frank Rossi are talking about uh, measuring certain characteristics of the field, soil, moisture, firmness, traction, and, and they're discussing some of Chase's work. Um, sampling really in depth on a field, so hundreds of samples and, and gritting that out versus, um, you know, maybe only 18 or 20 samples. So we're going to pick up the conversation there and uh, hopefully you all enjoy. I mean, if you can, you know, get this data, it can be useful in making decisions. How much do I got to date? Do I got to go in the gold mouth? Should I go by the, by where they stand? Should I just do a big grid across the whole field? What do you recommend? As far as testing location, I recommend a grid across the field if you're capable of it. Um, some of the sampling size research that I've done, we've sampled the field all the way down to 18 samples using a grid across the field versus 450 samples using a grid across the field. If you're going to make a map, which is a lot of what I do, then you're going to lose some accuracy in your mapping. But as far as the average and as far as the mean of your field for whatever you're measuring, that typically will not change based on those sample sizes that we tested. So if your whole objective is to just identify a mean or an average across your field, you know, 18, 20 samples will be good. And then you, since you're measuring such few samples in that instance, then you can actually start looking at the individual data points in target areas that might look out of whack based on those individual values at specific locations. But yeah, I, I recommend a grid. Um, I don't know why some of the standards aren't a grid, just so you cover the entire field. Um, and it kind of gives you your high and your lows too, right? I mean, so you have a, kind of a baseline uh, uniformity across your field. So that would be my suggestion. So, so you know, one of the things um, I'm sure everybody who manages a playing surface is thinking, well, this is good, you know, but what's actionable? What, what, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how I act, uh, number one. And, and number, you know, to me, it, it, it's, it, it, I don't know, it, it's, how much does it matter? Because I've seen some of your where you took, what did you take, 2,000 measurements on one field or something completely Somewhere ridiculous? Somewhere around there, yeah. How much cool. does each of that square meter matter from a safety perspective? Let's, let's start with the first question um, about what's actionable, right? Let's say you get a shear value that's X. Okay, yeah. what do I do? Does that mean something? Well, so I, I struggled with this question all through grad school because I'm out here collecting all this data. And you know, what's it for? You're right. When do we, how do we develop thresholds? How do we know when to do something actionable? And I think this is where it's really important to tie in athlete data. And that's when I started incorporating athletes because you know, we're, we're ultimately managing the fields for the athletes and there's no blanket suggestion that I can say is actionable really because it all depends on the athletes that use that field um, and to go to your point will a small area matter well it depends if it's uh, you know an abrupt bare area or a slight undulation yeah because if an athlete steps in that then they could get hurt um, but there's a whole psychology which I'm starting to work with sports psychologists on this stuff on with field conditions and it's a untapped research world um, the field conditions play such a huge role psychologically in, on an athlete. Um, and I did some work interviewing an athlete, did a small scale study, but they, they identify variations in the field and they adjust the, their behavior when they're in those areas. And that's a big deal. And that should be justification enough. So going back to the data, the data, I, it's, that's why it's so important to develop your own management plan based on your own values for your field and then communicating with those who use your field um, on what they want. And this is easier at the professional level or the collegiate level, but at the park and rec level even, um, kind of creating thresholds, talking with coaches, city league administrators, whatnot, how they feel about how the field conditions are and try to, try to base their feedback on your values and then adjust your management accordingly. It's so interesting because, you know, I've actually worked, this is going to sound crazy. I've worked in with the New York 
uh, racing association at the grass tracks at Belmont, Aqueduct, and Saratoga. And uh, I made them cut the grass a little lower to get it denser to see if we could hold it together better because they would let it go six, seven inches and it would get thin and wispy and divots would blow out. Well, as soon as they cut the grass lower and the horses could see the imperfections in the ground, they went crazy. They were driving the jockeys crazy because they weren't comfortable about putting their footing. I don't want to liken athletes to horses, but I think there is some subconscious uh, – value to that. I'll tell you another thing. We've learned from working with our soccer coach here to support your point about working with your athletes. We get him out there and he starts kicking the ball around and he says, I like when they can do this. And he takes how they take a ball and then deflect it and move to the next place. And he goes, yeah, it's a little, the timing's off, the ball's sticking. What? (laughs) Now, what I like is, what I like is he says the ball's sticking. He doesn't say, well, you should do this and you should do that. He says, because now I don't know what to do. I got really smart guys and we don't really know exactly what to do. So we're going to play around. We're going to test it again, get some numbers. So we always get the numbers. And then we ask him, how does he like that? How does he like this? And then we can say, oh, when we use the PGR, the sand and the mower like this, he likes that. Or when we roll three times a week, like we're rolling before a game and trying to wet before a game at the high levels, of course, right. That you can do that, but it does speak to uh, that sort of the value of that communication. Let me ask you about divots. Cause one of the things about grass fields, certainly I hear it from Andy and John about synthetics is that you don't divot, right. The foot sticks and, and they can perform better. It tends to be why I think a lot of them like, performing on synthetic turf sometimes how much does a a a little divot like that uh matter is are you suggesting if they see it they adjust how they play well you know a little divot maybe not but you know in some of these highly used recreational level fields that have you know square yard of bare thin turf that that will that could affect them i mean we i go back to georgia at our recreational fields we had a sprayer mishap where the spray boom got turned on and basically just killed a strip of grass. And it was right in the middle of the rugby goal. Um, and it was a little thin, you know, no more than a foot wide, but it was maybe, you know, six feet long. And that affected the players all season long because that was the field I was doing my research on. And I was talking to the players back and forth. Whenever they were in that area, over time, they knew it was there. They weren't looking at it, but they knew subconsciously it was there. and. Uh, that affected the way that they moved in that area because they were waiting to have some kind of misstep in that area. So yeah, small so, areas can affect, I think. Yeah. So here is the work you're doing now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Here's the work you're doing now. You want to take a minute and describe uh, what this is, what's involved with this research. Cause it looks like a heat map. Does it mean there's a lot of people where these red spots are and boy, is this suggesting you, and here's the goal mouth back here. Talk a little bit about this. This looks really cool. So this is, uh, so this device, that device is a GPS athlete tracking unit. Um, the athlete, these are becoming really common. Um, I think this is going to be the future. In, well, it's already here, uh, at least in the athlete data analytics from, from a performance standpoint. Um, a lot of the professional teams already wear them. Colleges already wear them. They're relatively affordable. I, I would assume they're going to start trickling down even into high school maybe uh, here relatively soon. Club sports teams are wearing them. Uh, but they, they, the athletes essentially are wearing a vest with a pocket in the back neck. And this little device is about an inch wide, three inches tall, and it just slides into a pocket in the back. And they wear them throughout the game, and it has an accelerometer in there as well as a GPS. So it's, me- it's measuring everywhere they go in the field, the time spent in the field. It's measuring accelerations, deceleration, all of these different performance variables. And one thing, one thing I always wanted to, to look at, and I was looking at in the study actually, is how can we tie this data that's already being collected? I mean, all these teams are already collecting all of this athlete performance data. How can we start making these connections to the field and how that's influencing their performance? Um, another thing with these softwares, with the GPS athlete tracker softwares, is they have surveys attached to them. So before each practice or game, they're asking athletes their soreness. They're able to pinpoint specific locations on their body where they're sore, where they're hurt. 
uh, there, there's post surveys. How hard did they feel like they, how much energy did they feel like they exerted? Uh, how much sleep did they get the night before? You know, there's all these different variables that can be tied together. And they're doing all of that over on the sports science side of things or the athletic training side of things. Why can't we tie our field data into it? One thing that always drives me nuts and anybody who's ever heard me do a presentation is th this whole concept of field playability and safety. We throw that word around all the time. What does that mean? Like, what does it mean? Well, so, I know it means, here's what I know it means. I know if the field's too hard, somebody's head's gonna crack open. And if the traction is in some value, some guys who've played around with this tell me maybe that's riskier. Yeah. That's what I can tell you safety is. That's as good as I can tell you. Yeah. So we have data now. We can collect we can collect the data and for a specific field with a specific team, even down to the individual athletes, because sports trainers have individual athlete profiles where they're 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 following each player's data. We can get it down to the specific player what is a safe environment for each player and what, what's a safe environment for each team. And we can start connecting that with our team if we manage, you know, we're obviously talking higher level fields here, uh, but we can start manipulating field conditions to, to suit an athlete or a team. And so that leads me to my last question before we see if anyone else has them is this is really cool. And I, you know, love sort of it, the research and how we're progressing. But it sounds like fundamental to this is a conversation with the users of your field. Now, this is not as always been a strong point for our sports turf managers, right? And it wasn't, and it's not always a strength of anybody in the turf business that we're excellent communicators. So how, you know, in how you're doing this and maybe the way you're approaching it in Texas, when you, when you visit all those Friday night light places, you know, it's high school football, it's still, 20,000 people showing up for a high school football game in Texas. But I don't know if they're doing the athlete tracking. That would be absolutely crazy to me. They probably are at some level. But sure let's, see if we can find, let's see if we can find a lower level. How do you start this conversation with coaches and communities? Where, where do you see this starting? Uh, because it seems to me some, somebody's got to reach out to the athletes because the athletes aren't going to come to us unless there's a complaint. Yeah. What, do, what, do, what do we say to start that conversation with the people who use our field? Well, I think it's a basic introduction of, you know, inter the field manager introducing yourself, whether it be to a team staff or team coach, and say, you know, look, I man we manage this field to a high level. We, we expect, we have high expectations for it, and we can, we can adjust the way that we do things around here based on your all's needs and just open up the conversation that way and, and ask what they expect. Don't assume what they expect based on what you, you expect. You know, ask what the team expects from the field and, and, and what you can do to help meet that expectation. Perfect, perfect ending, Carl. Let's, how about some questions? Any questions? Uh, no questions so far. Uh, you know, I think everybody's just kind of in awe, and I am too, just how much data we can collect, especially this athlete stuff now that you can put a tracker in. And, and, uh, and it's funny that, that the sports science side is, is so far ahead there. And then on the turf side, you say, hey, why don't you give us a little bit of that? And, uh, and, and we can make some, uh, some use of that too. So uh, no questions for now. Uh, sorry, I dropped off there a little bit, but um, at least we'll have the, most of the conversation with Chase uh, recorded. Yeah, and, and so let me just follow up, Chase. What do you think about our site-specific cultivation thing? Is, uh, are you seeing people doing that? Is, you know, as everybody's got reduced staff, uh, obviously, we, even without testing, you know where you got some hard spots. Uh, do you recommend that, or is that really messing up the uniformity of the field too much? I'm a little worried. I'm hoping I didn't create a problem here. But yeah, that's a good point because um, you don't want to overdo it, right? Whenever you site specific air file, that, that's an area of research that I want to go toward. That's kind of the next step from a management standpoint of, of what I want to look at is how can we use some of these soil moisture maps or, you know, like you said, you don't even need a map maybe to do some kind of site specific verification, but does that work? And does it actually improve uniformity uh, long term? Uh, how does that improve the longevity of the field? Uh, so th those are questions I think that need to be investigated a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a good start. It makes sense, right? If you airify the hardest part of your field and leave the other parts alone, uh, yeah. it should improve uniformity, but we just don't know that. 
Well, here's what we know it did. I know it 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 it's it softened it and it put it in that range. Now, if if I start measuring across the field, and if you can see this slide, you see what I'm talking about. As I start measuring across the field, I can see where my hardness is and target that and hopefully bring it in line at least with the the area around it. But you know, part of what I'm trying to understand is the resolution. You know, I, I don't want guys to dismiss that they're to do this chase because it's like, ah, it's going to take too much time. Maybe you just start where you know, hey, you got a square meter of bare ground. Why don't you start there, right? Or your goal mouth. You don't need to test that. There's no grass there. Raise it up, top dress it, those sorts of things. You don't necessarily need data to get started, but data, I think, helps with the – it gives us a shared language with the athletes and the coaches and the – you know – to, and our administrators. Right. And yeah, I don't want to switch gears to golf, but I did a study in Minnesota where we interviewed golf course superintendents on their knowledge of the variability within their fairways with respect to moisture for irrigation. And I think like 11 out of the 12 knew, you know, they knew their dry spots and their wet spots across their fairways. You, you don't need, you don't necessarily need data for everything. Uh, the value of having the data though is you have a number to create the thresholds and to, to communicate, like Frank said. But to, to do an action, to do some kind of action like airification or irrigation, you know, you know, most of the time managers will know their areas. And yes, that's definitely a good starting point. hundred percent. hundred percent. Well, Chase, Carl, how we doing? We got the 30 minutes. We're still the fastest 30 minutes in turf, brother. That's right. That's right. Um, I think that's a good stopping point. Uh, again, thanks. Thanks, Chase, for coming on. That's, uh, you know, I dropped out there for a little bit, but it is really fascinating to see how, um, these sorts of sorts of data sources are allowing us to, to be really the, site specific. You got the survey there, Carl? Um, yeah, so let me... Um, we'll take one more second up. and ask how this is working out because I got to tell you, Chase, I'm loving these conversations. I got Sorokin, I got you, I got McNitt, we got Rakaswa. There's a lot of people out there. You're the next generation, of course. You, you and Gerald have led the way, you know, in the sports turf area. I think the early guys were saying, and if you ask McNitt, studying the athlete changed things for everybody. The the connection between yeah. those things. And, you know, John Sorokin, who works for the Players Association in the NFL, you know, they're talking about adjusting contracts because of playing on synthetic turf over a long period of time. So, Carl, what do we got for the survey there? Yeah, just put it in the chat box for everybody. So uh, feel free to go in there. It's an anonymous survey, just uh, yeah. asking some questions on on these webinars, the information in here, and, and kind of how you're getting to the to the webinars. So yeah, we're um, trying to demonstrate some impact so that uh, we can continue to get support for the program. This has raised the profile a little bit, which has been really nice during these difficult times. And we're so grateful to my colleagues like Chase for joining me. You know, if I had anything to say, I would get invited. But I'm I'm just a good one at asking questions, so I'll just stay up here and hopefully you'll respond in the Qualtrics survey and tell us how this is working out for you, how much you like it. Uh, demonstrate our impact. And even if you're watching the recording, use the link uh, and give us that feedback. It's, it's really valuable to help us do this. And I know Chase, as a young extension faculty, uh, having, this me having this <laughs> measurable impact, uh, having this measurable impact, and we'll send you some of the notes we get so you can put it in your uh, reappointment package. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for joining us. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot, Carl. Thanks, yep. Thanks everybody. See you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.